Hello again, Exile, and welcome to another video in Noodle's complete lore series. This video covers Act 8. Let's begin. After slaying Arakali and escaping the Temple of Decay, we find ourselves on the outside of Sarn's ramparts. We travel along the fortified wall until we find some stairs leading up to the top of the ramparts. From here, we can enter the Sarn encampment. The encampment seems to be festering. The water is green and a nasty haze covers the place. Grigor has left mysteriously, telling Maramoa he wants to find a cure for his mutilated body and mind, and telling Clarissa he wants to find himself. Hargan suspects he has gone back to Esimir. Clarissa, Maramoa, and Hargan remain. Clarissa has raised Tolman from the dead and chained him up by her side. Maramoa tells us that the gods have risen in Sarn as well, the two sisters, Solaris and Lunaris, who have dedicated temples in Sarn, are waging war on each other and endangering Sarn. Argan tells us that a hag has appeared in the sewers, and he strongly suspects it's Doedre Darktongue. Sin also senses and smells her presence, so we head to the sewers to find her. Unlike Chevron and Malagaro, we had not previously encountered Doedre before we meet her in Act 4, guarding Malachi's organs. We know Doedre was a student of Malagaro before she got her nickname Dark Tongue, and Malagaro himself cut out her tongue. Doedre seems the most brutal and visceral of Malachi's three students. Doedre's method of thaumaturgy was to take things apart, to understand from dissection and destruction, rather than creating something new. Fun fact, there's reason to believe that Doedre's work was primarily creating virtue gems with curses, as implied by her own skills and items dedicated to Doedre. Doedre's manifesto gives some insight into why Doedre's spirit returns to the sewer of Sarn. She writes, Peel back the skin, for there are secrets in sinew, mysteries in muscle. Plunder the intestinal fortress, reach deep into bowels of power. The esoterica of kings lies not in the mind, but in the beating walls of bloodied heart. Other than her interest in people's insides, it is not clear why Doedre appears in the sewers, unlike Chevron and Malagaro, who have clear ties between their life and their location of reincarnation. As we travel deeper in these sewers, we find Doedre's cesspool, which sounds just lovely. Inside, we battle Doedre. Doedre seems to be a shapeshifter. She looks much different than her form in the belly of the beast, where she was a bloated, floating, wrinkly toad witch. Now she is thin, flabby to the point of being grotesque, and much more agile. When we successfully slay her, Sin comes to collect her soul. We now have the three spirits we need to revive the beast. The sewers sprawl all over the city, and from here we can go either towards the Solaris Temple to the east or the Lunaris Temple to the west. We'll head out to the east towards the key and Clarissa's romantic quest. Clarissa has plans to revive Tolman from his zombie status to normal resurrected human using an ancient artifact from the time of the first Emperor Veruso, called the Ankh of Eternity. Clarissa believes that somewhere in the key, the Ankh has been hidden, and she has set up her own resurrection site for Tolman once we've found it. The Ankh of Eternity is indeed hidden in the key. The Ankh is a thaumaturgical artifact supposed to revive the dead. Emperor Tarkus Veruso's wife, Kiara, died giving birth to their son. In Veruso's grief, he used the Ankh on her. By all accounts, Kiara was brought back from the dead with the Ankh. Even though Veruso has locked all the artifacts of Val Thaumaturgy in the depths of Mount Veruso, he turned to this thaumaturgical artifact to resurrect his wife. Clarissa believes that with the Ankh and the correct Asmerian ritual, she can revive Tolman. When we bring Clarissa the Ankh, she begins the ritual. Shockingly, Tolman does not resurrect cured and happy. He is aggravated and monstrous, and we slay him before Clarissa's eyes. Sorry, Clarissa. Clarissa laments that Veruso must have hidden the Ankh not as a valuable item too powerful for others to use, but because of its horrible effects. Hopefully, Clarissa will leave Tolman's body alone this time. To get to the Solaris Temple from the Key, we must travel through the Grain Gate. The Grain Gate was a landmark of the Purity Rebellion. 
Emperor Chittis had been hoarding food for his gemling legionnaires and elite loyalists. Victorio, the people's poet who helped High Templar Vol create unrest among the citizens of Sarn and utilize the sewers as his hiding place, knew Chittis was storing food in the grain gate. To draw attention away from where Vol would engage Sarn in the Purity Rebellion, Victorio told the starving people of Sarn about the food in the grain gate to inspire riots and draw guards away from the attack. The grain gate is near the slums and the marketplace that we explored in Act 3. Now, in this grain gate, we find some remaining legionnaires who appear untouched by the effects of the cataclysm. Malachi was aware of the radius of influence of Emperor Chittis's heart gem. Emperor Chittis Parandus had a virtue gem implanted above his heart, to give him thaumaturgical powers, but also to link him to all of his gemlings and have influence over them. That is why, when Mayor Ondar stabbed Emperor Chittis, many of the gemlings died, and were subsequently risen as the undying by the cataclysm not much later. Malachi was always a step ahead of both Emperor Chittis and Vol, and has managed to keep his favorite gemlings, led by Captain Alsaris, safe from both the Purity Rebellion and the Cataclysm. That is, until we come along and slay them almost 300 years later. We leave the Grain Gate and cross the Imperial Fields outside the city limits until we find an entrance to the Solaris Temple. In the second level of the Solaris Temple, where Diala once waited for us, we instead find a portal. Inside is a large sun and Dawn, Harbinger of Solaris. Dawn is an exile who is an extreme devotee of Solaris. He's guarding the sun orb, one of two ancient orbs we need to gather. We defeat Dawn, take the sun orb, and exit the Solaris Temple to the familiar Solaris Concourse, referred to as the Battlefront in Act 3. In Act 3, the Ebony Legion had taken over the Solaris Concourse on the hunt for Lady Diala. They had also blocked off the bridge that connects the Solaris Concourse to the Lunaris Concourse to protect Piety, who was primarily operating out of the Lunaris Temple. This is called the Harbor Bridge, and we are now able to cross it to get between the two temples. In the middle of the bridge is the Sky Shrine, but for now we will go past it to the Lunaris Concourse. In the Lunaris Temple, where we once fought Piety, is a moon and Dusk, Harbinger of Lunaris, another exile gone sycophant. We defeat Dusk and take the Moon Orb. Before we battle Solaris and Lunaris, we go out to the Lunaris Concourse, which connects to the Bathhouse. If we had gone west in the sewers, we would end up in the Grand Promenade. We did not explore this side of Sarn in Act 3. The Promenade was, quote, a favorite walk of noble lords. And in fact, we find it haunted by one notable lord now. Mayor Ondar, the man who betrayed and stabbed Emperor Chittis for the Purity Rebellion, is an apparition wandering here, notably with a dagger or short sword in hand. The bathhouse was where many notable elite of Sarn would go for more sinful pleasantries than walking. Hargan has told us that inside the bathhouse is a valuable heirloom he would like us to steal for him, called the Wings of Vastiri. The Wings of Vastiri is an ancient item made of gold, the highest symbol of office for the Mariketh, held by the Sekima of Sekimas. Hargan has a thing for collecting historical artifacts, it seems. The last time these wings of Vastiri were in the hands of the Mariketh was during Sekima Asenath's reign, the Sekima before Deshret. The Eternal Empire was driving the Mariketh out of their lands in the Vastiri Plains, and this effort was headed by Hector Titusius, the one who Deshret turned into a Roa saddle. General Hector Titusius, as we discussed in Act 4, was a fervent lover of thaumaturgy, having every joint in his body replaced by virtue gems. He was powerful and brutal. Sekima Asenath, wearing the wings of Vastiri, united all the Akaras, or tribes, of the Mariketh to fight together against Titusius. Unfortunately, Sekima Asenath was slain by Titusius, and the Mariketh were driven back out of the Vastiri Plains. Titusius kept the wings of Vastiri as a prize and took them with him to the bathhouse, which is now his tomb. General Hector Titusius has risen and now stands beside this tomb. With all his armor, it's hard to tell if the undead Titusius has any skin. 
However, the amount of blood effects during this battle make me hope Deshret left no skin after making a saddle out of his hide. After we kill Titusius, we can open his tomb to find the wings of Vasteria and return them to Hargan. Why we don't return these prized wings to the Mariketh up in Highgate is a question of our morality we'll just all have to sit with. There is one minor god in Act 8, and he lives in the High Gardens that connect to the bathhouse, not to be confused with the Imperial Gardens of Act 3 around the Scepter of God. At the end of the High Gardens resides Yugal, Reflection of Terror. Yugal is another Val god like Ralakesh and Arakali of Act 7. Yugal was a scholar who became obsessed with what he believed was the most powerful and universal experience, terror. Yugal would kidnap children and terrorize them, using a device of his own creation called an Eldritch Mirror, to amplify and extend that experience of terror for his studies. Yugal wrote that, In nature, there are many feelings exclusive only to man, but terror is not one. Terror flourishes in our world, transcending all things. It is the bedrock on which our great cosmos is formed. Yugal discovered something in his studies horrific or powerful enough for Yugal to bend Val leadership to his whim and have some Val worship him. And so, Yugal became a god. Yugal resides in a section called the Pools of Terror, which is an apt parallel to his Mirrors of Terror. Yugal appears in the form of a fetid maw, a truly terrifying creature with a mouth down its entire body and two arms and two legs bent backwards, misshapen and springy. We can kill Yugal for another minor pantheon power. We return to the center of the harbor bridge to the Sky Shrine with our sun and moon orbs. These orbs are ancient, said to exist before the Asmerian tribes were founded. According to Hargan, the sun's orb said to contain all that has been, while the moon orb holds all that will be. On the floor of the Sky Shrine is a large mural with half the moon and half the sun. Above it looms a large statue of two sisters battling ferociously. At the base of this shrine, we can place the sun and moon orbs. Solaris and Lunaris are Asmiri gods, and the oldest gods besides sin and innocence that we have encountered so far. There is an Asmirian creation myth that Solaris and Lunaris were able to control the sun and moon respectively. Solaris was thought to guide the sun across the sky with threads of shimmering gold, whilst Lunaris sought the wax and wane of moon with a sickle of purest silver. They were twin sisters who ruled together over the ancient Asmiri for a time. The exact timeline of the following events is unclear, but during Solaris and Lunaris' rule, a trickster named Tangmazu was able to turn the sisters against each other, leading the sisters to wage war on each other for the rest of time. Someone wearing a gray mask, presumably Tangmazu, masquerading as Lunaris or a Lunaris devotee, captured Solaris and imprisoned her. Her flames were quenched, her life laid bare. While Solaris was captured, Lunaris ruled on, alone. After many days, a devotee of Solaris named Colric found Solaris deep beneath the earth and freed her. Solaris came back to earth and captured Lunaris in flaming nets, vowing to repay her kin in kind, blinding Lunaris with a sharpened blade, chaining her up and locking her in a cage. Solaris then slaughtered all of Lunaris's devotees, then turned on Lunaris and demanded she tell the truth about Solaris's initial capturing, torturing her as she drew her confessions, but Lunaris spoke not a word to her sister insane. Lunaris was rescued by her last devotee, Kulina, who hid Lunaris away so she could heal. Lunaris was not aware of what had happened to Solaris and thought Solaris had simply gone mad, but was urged by Kalina to wage war in turn against Solaris. Since then, Solaris and Lunaris have been at war, separate entities forever in battle. However, in Act 3, Grigor does tell us that the Eternals revered Sun and Moon as the two eyes of their god, the right eye judging Solaris, the left eye merciful Lunaris. So even in their war, they are often worshipped together. It's hard to pinpoint why Solaris would believe that Lunaris was behind her initial capture, or capable of doing that. 
We know it was Tangmazu who captured Solaris, but his motivations are also unclear. It is probable that the Grey Mask was associated with Lunaris in some way. But previous to this incident, the two had ruled together and were seemingly very close. There is a three-part story told by the captured souls to upgrade Soul of Lunaris in our Pantheon that I'm unsure is related but may play some part. In this story, Lunaris has a sickly child, who she drowns in the ocean as a mercy, as the boy couldn't be healthy until he was silent, clean, and still, in Lunaris's mind. The Asmiri tribe that Solaris and Lunaris ruled together put Lunaris on trial for this murder, but her fiery sister fought in vain to defend her. This means this incident must have happened before the capture of Solaris, as Solaris still loved her sister enough to defend her before their people. However, the story implies Lunaris does go a bit mad from this incident. I'll quote the entire third section. But Lunaris refused to admit any wrongdoing. She'd saved her child, had she not? He was safe now, buried beneath the dirt. Conviction gnarled around her fragile mind, and in her pride, she rose to seat a deathless throne. The term deathless throne is a phrase referring to immortality, but it's an interesting choice in the context of Lunaris and Solaris continuing to rule after Lunaris had killed her own son. Perhaps murdering her own child and seeing nothing wrong with it put a seed of doubt into Solaris's mind so that it seemed possible Lunaris could betray Solaris. Clearly, Tangmazu's gray mask was used to implicate Lunaris, or at least her devotees, but for Solaris to believe it was possible, there had to be some seed of doubt. Tangmazu was able to succeed in turning the sisters against each other. When we place the sun and moon orbs at the base of the statue depicting Lunaris and Solaris fighting, they burst to life. For a moment, the two battle each other, still compelled by their eternal war. Then they take turns battling us, and we defeat them both, ending their eternal struggle. We now have Solaris and Lunaris as major gods in our pantheon. On defeating the sisters, we can travel out to the aqueduct leading to Highgate, which is now flowing with blood. Thank you for watching, it's your boy Noodle. If you're enjoying this series, consider liking this video and subscribing. Check out the rest of the series in the playlist below. I'm taking a quick hiatus from Twitch, but thank you to all my patrons supporting this video series, and feel free to leave any questions in the comments below. And until next time, stay sane, exile.